Our primary focus is here in the province. Uh, we try to deal with water quality issues that affect people here in Saskatchewan. But we also have active programs all around the world. Uh, from those programs, we're able to recruit top students, postdocs, and visiting scholars to come here and work with us. Some of the current projects that we're involved in involve both wastewater and drinking water treatment. So we do both laboratory-based and field studies. By working from both ends, putting things together, we can generally figure out what's going on and try to make predictions of what will happen in the future and advise policymakers what they might do to assure that we have enough clean water to support our sustainable development through the future. Most of my research focuses on the impact or influence of industrial activities on water quality and that includes both mining and um, uh, metal processing activities as well as agricultural activities. In many situations when an industrial activity influences water quality, that is the main focus at the time and a lot of assessment focuses on contamination of the water. But over time what happens is the contaminants tend to build up in the sediments and the sediments become a reservoir for contamination. Once a source of contamination, whether it be an effluent from a mining facility or some agricultural operation, ceases to exist and that facility shuts down, the water will clear itself up over a period of time, but the sediments become a reservoir and serve as a legacy that has integrated that pollution load over time. And a lot of the work that we focus on in my research group is how do you assess the risk of that contamination. Sometimes we need to look back in time. To do that, we actually look back in the sediment. We can look at nutrients to tell what was there before humans started changing the environment as drastically as we have. We can look at pigments of the different kinds of plants that were there to determine were these blooms natural or are they caused only by human activity. So for a person like Lauren Doig, it's like reading a book. He can look at that core and take little thin sections and by making these measurements actually tell us year by year by year when the adverse algal bloom started and what effect they're having on the ecosystem. Here's a core that we've collected. So we can see the reddish brown up on top uh, where it's well oxidized. This is the iron oxides and organic matter. So we can see the invertebrates have burrowed down into the, into the sediment itself. We see remains of a little fingernail clams in here. We see a lot of biological processes going on. That affects the, the geochemistry of the sediment profile, whether it's in these, uh, near these little burrows or at the sediment water interface. What happens at a, a number of mining operations is there'll be an effluent discharge and there'll be metals possibly at low concentrations discharged, but they can accumulate downstream in the sediments. We're actually monitoring uh, environmental effects by using the animals that are there. Changes in the community of animals will tell us a lot about the health of the ecosystem. We might bring these then into the lab and, and try toxicity testing and uh, test with, with standard animals that we use in the lab under control conditions to look for toxic effects. We'd look at the chemistry to say, well, what contaminants are there or are they at concentrations high enough to cause problems. More recently we've gotten into techniques where we um, have taken paleolimnological tools. That is these tools where they use depositional sediments such as this that are deposited sequentially over time and by looking at the, the physical and the chemical properties of these sediments and the changes in those over time and the fossil remains from all these small animals that live, whether it's plankton or um, zooplankton. And we can use these remains to, to reconstruct their communities over time and how they've changed over time. So we can see, well, what's the trajectory of this system? What was this system like before they were in industrial operations? Because often we don't have long-term monitoring data to tell us what a system was like beforehand. So we don't know if we're trying to remediate then, well, what are we trying, what state are we trying to remediate to? So we can use sediments not only to look at the availability of contaminants and nutrients, but also to reconstruct the history 
of a site uh, such as a, a lake or a pond where the sediments have stayed in place. One of the instruments we use where we can now analyze the contaminant load is called an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. And what it allows you to do is inject a dissolved sample to extract all of the metals from it into an aqueous phase in acid, but then it can be analyzed by this machine. It allows you to scan almost the entire periodic table of elements in one injection of one sample. So in one sample, we can easily look for 25, 30, or 40 different metals at the same time. So it's very efficient. Also, this particular instrument is extremely sensitive and can analyze uh, metals down to the parts per trillion level. The other advantage with one of the gadgets we have on here is we have a high pressure liquid chromatography system coupled to the ICPMS, which actually allows us to do what we call metal speciation. So some elements like arsenic, which is one of the elements we're studying in Buffalo Pound, can be found in different forms. It can be found in two different forms of inorganic arsenic, arsenic-3 and arsenic-5, and it can be present in several different forms of organic arsenic. Not all of those forms of organic arsenic are equally toxic. So in order to do a risk assessment to understand arsenic toxicity, you need to understand what form of arsenic is actually there. And the HPLC system allows you to separate those arsenic species before it goes into the mass spectrometer where you quantify the concentration of each of those. Since the soils in Saskatchewan traditionally have a lot of arsenic in them, there is a potential for arsenic to also be released from reservoir sediments along the way with phosphorus. The question is, is, well, how do the sediments in this lake participate in the cycling of phosphorus and is, is this changing over time? What factors govern this? This is important information in terms of being able to uh, model the lake uh, in terms of uh, seasonal algae production which are linked to uh, blooms which you know, can produce toxins. Um, there are all sorts of taste and odor issues associated with algae blooms and phosphorus is, is usually the limiting, the limiting factor so uh, that's why the, the high level of interest in phosphorus in particular as opposed to other nutrients. We have very few sediment quality guidelines in Canada and those that we do have focus on the total contaminant load, which may not be relevant. In certain situations, if we have sediment quality guidelines based on total metals that exceed some threshold based on total metals, but is well below anything biologically relevant because most of it is not biologically available, we may be spending a significant amount of money on trying to fix a problem that's not really a problem. With the relatively few regulations we have to determine what level of contaminants and sediments are safe, there are opportunities for this type of research for decades to come.